Guten Tag, Männer und Vieren. Heute schwein wenn uns da ein Fockerwolf so ein Hundert Kondor. Sorry for my terrible German, it's been a long time. Yes, this episode is on the German heavy bomber, the Gurrier, as the Allies named it, or the Scourge of the Atlantic as it also became known, uh, due to its high success rate against Allied shipping between June of 1940 and February of 1941, sinking nearly 365,000 tons worth of Allied shipping. It may have contributed to much more losses, however, due to its reporting of Allied transports to the U-boats while on reconnaissance missions. Now this is the Fokker Wolf 200. Uh, the Fokker Wolf 200 was, proposed, was a proposal from famed German designer Kurt Tank to Dr. Rudolf Stilzer of the Deutsche Lufthansa, sorry, Lufthansa, sorry, Lufthansa, there we go, um, the German civil aviation company um, back in the wartime period. Uh, it was proposed as a passenger plane to fly from Germany to America. At the time, this was highly unusual as seaplanes were most commonly used for such flights, so they could land if needed for refueling or in an emergency in the ocean, and they wouldn't, of course, sink. Uh, the Condor, named after the bird due to its very long wingspan, uh, and this was the reason for the, such a wide wingspan was because it was made to cruise at an altitude of 900 sorry, 9,800 feet, um, as high as possible without a pressurised cabin at the time. At that time, all other passenger planes would fly at a maximum of around 500, sorry, 5,000 feet. For a small time in history, this made the Condor the most advanced passenger plane of all time. From 1937 until 1940, where the Boeing 307 became a thing, um, with a pressurised cabin which meant it could fly much higher and of course the DC-4 came out a couple of years later. The plane was designed by Ludwig Mittelhuber and first flown a few years after the project got greenlit. Um, sorry, not a few years, a year. It was, it was pr pretty much a year after the project got greenlit. It was actually flown by Kurt Tank. Um, he was the, the test pilot as well as one of the designers back then. Uh, the plane was an all-metal four-engine monoplane and highly advanced for its time, initially equipped with a Pratt & Whitney Hornet engine, giving it 875 horsepower per engine. Uh, it was capable of carrying 26 passengers for a range of around about 1,860 miles, 3,000 kilometres, uh, which meant it could make it to America with only the one stop. This was later... Uh, changed with the plane however but I'll go into details that shortly. <clears throat> with the outbreak of the war the American engines were replaced with the BMW 132 engines which had around about 160 horsepower less than the original engines. This did affect its cruising speed and climb rate. Originally the Fokker Wolf 200 was designed for maritime patrols um, for the Japanese Navy with the V10 version of the plane. Now this was the military design purpose of it. Originally it was designed for passengers, as I say. The uh, the military version was actually designed first for the Japanese, not for the Germans. They did not make it to Japan, however, as the war broke out, and were adopted for use by the Luftwaffe. For wartime service, the plane had hard points added to the wings, the fuselage was strengthened and extended for a little more space. Front and aft dorsal guns were added, and an extended version of the Bola Ventral Gondola was added to allow an internal bomb bay along with heavily with a heavily glazed nose with a defensive machine gunner either end of it. This also added, of course, the Bombardier. However, this added weight caused some major issues for the plane. With the added weight of the um, military upgrades, it caused the plane issues with landing and many planes actually would break up when landing due to the extra weight. Uh, so, the problem was actually never solved. The workaround was for the pilots to touch the plane down as gently as possible. And this was one of the main problems with the plane, is the, the pilots had to actually land it very gently. Um, <coughs> when going down, they had to be very, very careful with it. Um, pulling up at the last minute, just getting as soft a landing as possible. 
um, I think the landing speed was around about 80 miles per hour. Um, otherwise they would suffer problems and of course they had to do it very gently because otherwise the wings would actually break. Later models were equipped with a UHF band radar system in the nose and finally in 1943 the Henschel HS-293 guided missiles were placed on the plane. Due to its stability and good takeoff capacity it was a good platform for the radio guided missiles. Now these were the um, missiles designed for civil shipping basically. Um, they weren't the... I'm trying to think of the name of it now and I can't. Um, they weren't for the armoured ships. They, they they were slightly lighter bomb. They were around about um, 500 pounds I think off the top of my head. Um, and they had a, a jet system on them um, and of course they were radio operated by the um, by, by the bombardier. Uh, this gave the um, Allies much problem because this thing was really accurate. The plane could just drop it at a high altitude and then guide it to the target. Usually they had a flare on the back so the uh, pilot could, well sorry, the bombardier could actually see where they were going um, because otherwise they would lose track of them. It's a bit like using the ATGMs in the game. Um, you have a similar sort of feel for it and that's what the bombs were like. Um, they were very effective and very deadly and um, really did put the fear of God into the Allies. Uh, the later variant which had um, which was designed for um, armoured ships was extremely um, scary. Um, many many people were, were it, it was very scary because it was such a unique system um sorry i'm just looking it up on my thing to try and find the exact name of the bomb because it's going to annoy me the fritz x there we go the fritz x gravity bomb um <coughs> which uh was a guided bomb variant as well um it was a gravity bomb though so it would be guided down with gravity but it was designed to penetrate armored ships um, whereas the Henschel HS-293 uh, was designed to take out um, merchant ships with much more accuracy than just dropping bombs. Let me get back to my notes now. There we go. The Fokker Wolf 2000, sorry, 200 uh, was a very good passenger plane and was in use up until the 1950s and an upgraded with extra fuel tanks was the first heavier than air aircraft to fly non-stop between Berlin to New York. Um, the flight took place in August of 1938 and took nearly 25 hours. Um, this was the first plane to ever fly from Germany to America and that, that's a pretty unique point. Um, the same plane actually did a trip to Tokyo as well from Germany, but it did stop off, um, stopped off somewhere over the, um, I think it was Dubai, around that area. Um, and then again, it stopped in China as well for a refuel. Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Uh, so yeah, it, it was a very interesting vehicle in that respect. Having that record, it had numerous records for distance and altitude at the time. It was it was a really advanced passenger plane and it was a by all state um by all um um that I've read up about it basically it was a very good passenger plane and very light um the pilots really did love this plane. <coughs> In 1939, a Condor, designated D-ACVH, flew to Moscow with Joachim von Riedentrop aboard to sign the Treaty of Non-Aggression with Russia. Um, so yeah, again, the Condor... Condor has a lot of interesting parts in history, but it's one of those planes that does get forgotten quite often, unfortunately. Let's switch the markers back on, actually, just so we can see what we're up to here. Um, 
Following the fall of France, the Kriegsmarine used the Focke-Wulf 200 to great success, making, making loops across the North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. At first it was used for reconnaissance, searching for convoys to report positions for the U-boats and the wolf packs of the U-boats. Uh, however, later loaded with 900 kilograms worth of bombs, or mines, the plane started its bombing range on the merchant shipping in the Atlantic. Due to the plane's poor bomb sight, it would perform attacks by flying at low altitude, releasing three bombs towards the target and pulling up on release, pretty much guaranteeing a hit. It, it basically released the bombs at point blank range. Now, just here we see the bomb bays. I'll talk to talk about those a little bit in a moment. After the Blumen Voss 138C came into service on March of 1941, the Condor was put back to reconnaissance and to avoid combat to preserve numbers of the planes. It wasn't until August of 1941 that saw the first loss of the Fokker Wolf 200 Condor, after it was shot down by a catapult aircraft from a merchant ship launched, um, sorry, a catapult aircraft merchant ship, or CAMS ship. Um, it launched the, the Hawker Hurricane, or the Hurricat, or the Catacan, uh, another name for it as well. It was basically a um, hurricane that was placed on a um, steam catapult, and the pilot would be launched off the merchant vessel, and fly up, intercept a bomber, chase off the bombers basically, shoot them down if possible, and then they would ditch the plane next to the merchant vessel and sometimes they would winch the plane up on back on board um, a bit worse for wear of course and take it for repairs or generally they would just leave it to sink um, it was a very wasteful exercise it was a it was a very big stopgap measurement in the war it was basically oh, it was it was something that was needed for the merchant vessels because they had no air defence at the time. They, they had, of course, anti-aircraft guns and things like that, but they were pretty pathetic. Um, most of them just had 7.7mm uh, Vickers guns and things like that on board, which didn't really have the capability to shoot down an aircraft that was flying above um, 2,000 feet. And, of course, if the Condor's flying around up above the, the merchant fleet, then chances are it's reporting their position to submarines. So again, it's vitally important to take them down. So the um, CAMS ships were a thing, and they were a thing up until the introduction of the um, Grumman Martlet, which is the uh, Wildcat, I think off the top of my head, um, operating off the new escort carriers that were used in fleet transports. And that was in uh, 19... 42 I think just early 42 um, they were basically small carriers that had a very small flight of fighters on board but they would sail in the middle of the fleet basically uh, you know, you'd have about five or six merchant vessels a destroyer and the carrier going along um, basically just to to keep these aircraft away the other thing of course is they could use the planes to spot the submarines uh, which was great use and did help take down some of the um some of the submarine issues that the uh the uh, merchant ships were having at the time a very important date is the 14th of august of 1942 a focke wolf 200 c3 was taken down by a p40c and a p38f over iceland um the planes were operating from iceland and this was the first German plane to be shot down by a US Army Air Force pilot, which makes it a very important date. As I say, it's a, one of those things that, you know, it, it's the, it, it really did boost some morale, you know. It was, you know, finally taking the fight to the Jerry's and all that sort of hoo-ha. Anyway, with the Atlantic lost to these planes, they were used more for transport of supplies, most notably aiding the German military in the Battle of Stalingrad. Overall, 276 Condors were produced um, from 1937 until 1944. 
One last noticeable Condor I'm going to talk about today is the Focke-Wulf 200V3. It was an unarmed passenger plane. Uh, it did have a gondola on board, but it was a completely unarmed plane. There was no, no defensive armaments on it at all. Originally it was suited out for 26 passengers, but this was taken down to two lavish cabins um, and had the marking of D2600 and was named Immelmann III after the World War I ace Max Immelmann, uh, a chap that a certain person idolised quite a lot really. The main cabin had a large wooden table, um, a bed, uh, lots of bits of furniture but it had a main chair um, and the cabin was also armoured. The chair was a special armoured chair that the passenger would pretty much sit in at most times. The chair had a automatic parachute system on board as well with a downwards ejecting system so basically um, just below his this cabin there was actually a bottom section that would just blast out um, with a small bit of explosives and then launch the, the uh, chair out underneath the plane in an emergency. This plane was flown by Hans Bührer, um, who had been flying since the First World War and um, he did quite an interesting character all in all. Um, he was a uh, spotter pilot for artillery originally and then became a courier pilot. Uh, he flew up until the end of the Second World War where he was captured by the Russians and he was a personal friend and pilot of the Führer. Yes, this was his personal plane. Um, it was basically to replace the Junkers um, JU-85 I think it was. Oh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head there for a second, That's that's hard to do. Um, I think it was the tri-engine junkers that they had before that. Um, basically, Hans Bührer said that the Condor was just a much better plane, and with the weight reduction, it, it had none of the landing issues. Uh, it was a very comfortable plane to fly, and it was very good, um, and it was just a really nice plane to be a passenger in. And also, because the pilots did really like flying, it was a very easy plane to fly. Because of the wingspan, it was very comfortable to fly as well at altitude. Um, it had a good cruising speed and a good cruising altitude, which meant it was usually too high to be attacked by fighters at the time, um, which was also another big advantage, as well as being out of range from flak and anti-aircraft guns, of course. This plane was destroyed in July of 1944 uh, after an Allied bombing raid took out the um, the aircraft in the area to stop any escapes. So that's the uh, history of the Focke Wulf 200. Now, sadly, there is only one of these planes left in the world. Uh, it was recovered from the Trondheim Fjord in Norway. Um, it was around about 60. Deep, I think deep or 60 meters deep I think 60 meters actually um, and it was in pretty poor shape pretty much most of it disintegrated when they got it back onto the, the ship and shipped it over it is being repaired and rebuilt at the German Museum of Technology in Berlin however and I really do hope that they can rebuild one of these because it is a fantastic plane and a huge bit of history for Germany um, as the aforementioned flight to America, uh, there's many plaques celebrating it in Germany. There, there's a lot of history for this plane, and it was a very good civil plane. Um, as I say, it, it, it had a career in war, and it, yes, it did do some serious damage to the uh, Allied shipping, but its technology, its history, it's, it's a plane that really does need to exist still and it, it's a beautiful plane to say as well. Now in game we get the Focke Wulf 200 C1. It was the first military produced version of this plane. It had three bomb bays uh, and two hard points on the wings. Now as I said with the bomb bays we've got the, um, let's just switch to this, this camera here, 
we've got the bomb bays nestled in the engine um, nestles here so you have the bomb bays on the outboard engines and then you've got the landing gear on the inboard engines as well as you know the, the rear landing gear as well I'm getting attacked here by a TB1 and we're using our um, 7.92 millimeter machine guns here for defensive fire missing terribly um, getting a couple of hits um, and we've managed to damage the cooling system on the engine so that's good and we've taken a couple of hits from the uh, heavy machine guns on board but we're close to our airbase uh, reloading I'm just doing some defensive flying just trying to avoid it as much as I can um, the plane has a good capability of bomb load as well um, sadly we don't get the upgraded versions of the Condor we've only got the one version in game which is a real shame because later versions were equipped with MG15s um, sorry MG151s um, the 15mm machine gun cannons as well as 20mm MG151 20s as well um, which would give this plane a much better defensive armament what we have in game at the moment is the plane with the four MG15s, which is a 7.92 millimeter machine gun. Um, you've got the choice of armored targets or tracers. Uh, generally, I would suggest going with the tracers because it has the armor-piercing incendiary shell, whereas the armored targets is just pure armor-piercing. In-game plane is a, a BR of 2.3. It carries a decent playload for the BR as well, uh, with the ultimate load being um, two 1,000 kilogram bombs and two 500 kilogram bombs. This means you are capable of taking out one and a half bases on a flight, as you saw in this vi its replay. I took out one base, um, and the rest of my payload was actually used on the airfield. Um, but with this, at this low BR, if you do have all your bombs on board, you are capable of taking out an airfield in one hit. Um, however, the very poor defensive armament with the with only four 7.92mm machine guns, which have a really poor arc of fire, uh, does mean that you are at a disadvantage. As you can see here, um, the machine guns from the gondola, the arc of fire is very poor the um, ventral machine guns from the top again has a very poor arc of fire the rear machine gun does have a relatively good arc of fire but only from the top gun the lower gun again has a very poor arc of fire now one of the beautiful things about this plane is actually its landing gear it has the forward facing landing gear um, which come down as you can see it's the hydraulic landing gear it is an absolutely gorgeous plane um, I just can't get over how pretty it is the good thing about this landing gear setup is it is relatively robust. Now, as you'll see here, I'm coming in nice and slow, pull it up, get a nice soft landing. It's a relatively easy plane to land in game. Um, you just have to watch out for stall speeds, that's all. Another problem is the plane is rather slow and it does have a very poor rate of climb. Um, one of the advantages is one of the advantages though is you do start off with the high altitude bomber spawn uh, which means at lower BRs you should be able to get your bombs off without being intercepted most of the time uh, usually planes can't climb that far because you usually start around about 14,000 feet it is an okay plane for bombing um, and really the only heavy bomber for Germany currently which is a real shame and just to specify that's non-premium as the Germans do have some heavy bombers with the premiums um, it also has the highest payload until you get to the DO217E2 at BR 4.7 as well. Um, again, it's it's um, it's a decent bomber to play around with. As you see there, the, the actual cockpit, the top opens up, and that was the emergency escape for the pilots there. Uh, for Premium planes, you know, you, you could go the Wellington or the uh, BV239. Um, I might be wrong on that number there. But they have a much better payload, of course, than the Condor. 
but they do start at a higher BR of course. All in all, the plane is good. It's a good plane to practice bombing with as it is a good steady base. Um, it's a good plane if you want to sort of learn the basics of heavy bombers. Uh, it does suffer from that lack of payload as I did say. One of the big things though is it is a very pretty plane and it is one of my favourite looking bombers. It's just so sleek and it's just such a pretty airframe. At its BR it is a perfectly good plane but up tiered you will die quite often. You do really suffer from up tiering. So we're just going to fast forward this video because um, basically we're, we're coming to the end of the uh, video here but we're going to do some climbing. Now our team is suffering, that TBD there finally gets taken out by the BF-109 and I'm climbing because if I can take out that airfield we will win. Now you can see here how slow this plane is at climbing. Um, this is at 16 times normal speed as you can see and we are really struggling to get altitude um, and speed. You know, I, I'm basically, um, I, I've got my radiators fully open, I'm manual engine controlling here, I'm really really gunning it as hard as I can, I'm weaponing as much as possible. I would prefer to get to around about seven to 8,000 feet for a bomb run on a airfield. Uh, just because it can be very, very risky going in this low. Uh, but we are running out of time. The ticker is coming down quite quickly. So we are going to be winning this game whether I live or die as long as the fighter stays alive. Now one last thing I'd like to do um, is just do a quick shout out to a fan. Uh, JD Sun. Um, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it, mate. Um, even if you did shoot me down, you bastard. Um, but your message really cheered me up the other day. Um, I was flying the uh, Vampire, because I'm going to be doing a video on the Vampire eventually. Oh, God, that plane is awful. Um, <laughs> I, I hate flying jets, but the Vampire is one of those planes. I love it, but I hate it at the same time. Um, and bumped into him when I was playing. He was playing a... Um, 262 and took me down with relative ease um, but he sort of mentioned and just asked for a quick shout out so if you do see me in game please feel free to ask for a shout out in the video I'm more than happy to do it and I do appreciate all the you who watch so right here we're coming up to the airfield the game is pretty much over and um, the enemy is actually flying over our um, our airfield I think now um, one of them gets shot down by AAA so we're flying over the airfield, all the bombs away, and just pause here for a moment. I'm going to go to free cam, and as you can see, the um, 500 kilogram bombs are kept in the middle section here. So in the mid bomb bay here, which is it's a very small bomb bay, um, just because it is the gondola style. So one of the weird things with the German planes with the gondola is. The bomb bay doesn't extend up to the plane, it's only in the gondola section here. Um, but of course you do have the extra bomb points on the wings here, however they only fit 500 kilogram bombs, the 1000s have to sit on the hard points on the wings. Um, so as you can see the gondola is purely just there, it's like an aftermarket add-on for those bombs. And bombs away, let's just switch back to the camera and they have gone out and we're just going to fly over the airfield and try not to die from flak now because those bombs will be going down shortly and all of a sudden we're going to start getting lit up by flak and as you can see boom boom that is the end of that airfield and that is game set and match for us so we'll just head back to the hangar um, getting a victory in the Condor is always nice, and just the nice screen here with the Condor flying along as well, which is always nice to see. Um, relatively good game actually, I actually ended up making almost 7,000 research points for my next plane in that match alone, um, just because I got a few upgrades and was, have almost aced this plane now. Um, 
but we'll just look at it in hangar view. It's got really no armor. There is slight armor on the back of the pilot seat, but it's really not very effective. As you can see with the X-ray, um, the fuel tanks are pretty much all in line. Uh, this thing does carry a ridiculous amount of fuel. Um, you've got about 800 hours worth of fuel on board, which if you take a full tank, you're not going to run out of fuel ever in this plane. Um, the radial engines are not great, uh, being the BMW engines. They have takeoff power of 800 horsepower, but general power of 665. Uh, the machine gunners, as I said, the 7.92 millimeter machine guns are very poorly placed. Um, again, as I say, with that gondola system that they had on the plane, because it was sort of an aftermarket thing, it affected the plane's speed ultimately, but also it doesn't leave for very good positioning of the gunners. Uh, later versions did have powered t um, turrets, um, the same turret that is actually on the Bloom and Voss um, 238 here. Um, they had the same these turrets here basically, um, the standard round turrets as well as the powered turrets. They actually have fitted a couple of powered turrets to the plane, um, which was a great benefit to its defensive capability. But the standard one, as you see, is just very... It's not great for defensive positioning. Um, the machine gun arc on the rear only comes to around about here, so effectively you only have... Um, about 25 degrees of fire arc each side with the machine guns and the front machine gun is probably about 15 to 20 it's really not a very good arc of fire um, modification wise as I say the bombs um, you get your standard bombs which are your 250s um, the 6500 pound bombs are pretty good um, but you do need four of those with memory, if memory serves me correctly, to kill a base. So with that loadout, you still can't kill a base. Um, the 1,000 kilogram bombs are your best bet because you will kill a base with one shot. Um, taking out the 1,000s with the um, 500s is usually what I like to do because it gives you the best explosive mass for bombing bases. However, the 250s are useful if you are going for light targets or vehicles. Um, so you can drop the 1000s uh, because they are hard pointed on the wings and then you can drop the 250s at your leisure on smaller targets. The armor piercing tracer is usually the best option because you have the armor piercing incendiary sh shells. Um, with the AP rounds it's just armor piercing and armor piercing tracing bullets. The default is not too bad in all honesty because you do get um, the twin incendiary rounds but you do get the omnipurpose bullet, the ball bullet, which is just a spark bullet basically. So usually I take out the armor piercing tracer. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, please give me a like, a subscription or anything you feel like. Uh, let me know what you think below as well about the Focke Wolf 200. Um, and yeah, I will catch you next time for another History of video. Thank you so much for watching. Until then, this is Screedzilla out. Bye bye.